So that okay. long pause there is called your respiratory pause, and that is when you're most at rest. So if you are behind your rifle, you take a deep breath in, you exhale, and then you can sit there, and that is where on that exhale is where you actually should be starting your trigger squeeze. All right, everybody, this one has been a long time in the making. We have Nick Loffenberg across the table from Mark and myself, Jimmy on the mic, in case I actually had somebody once say that every time I introed, I'd say all the other people in the room, and they'd never actually figured out my name. So, Jimmy here, a couple hundred (laughs) episodes in. Um, And in the room, as usual, we have MC Ryan on the uh, controls, the things that we don't understand, and there's also another person in the room. It is Steven. Steven is, uh, like, new and... New Britney. He runs the show. <laughs> New Britney. A lot of people uh, a lot of people don't really know what I'm referring to. If you've listened to some of our older podcasts, Britney kept our lives in order, and now that's Steven's job. But Britney's still here. A lot of the scheduling keeps things on track. That's right. So, shout out to Steven. Okay, anyway. Well, I'll say this, Jim. I'm going to steal your intro here. Much like the listeners are finally getting to know your name, which is which is a good thing. We're finally getting to a very important topic. We've, Absolutely. We've talked about a lot of the intricacies, the finer points of shooting, and we're finally getting back to the fundamentals of marksmanship. Yeah, we mention it all the time. I, I, so often we're like, well, okay, let's talk about this really complicated thing. Of course you have to have the fundamentals of marksmanship down first, but okay, back to the complicated thing. We haven't actually hit on what those are. So, Nick, yeah. you have the wonderful opportunity of uh, discussing this with us. And um, so, like I alluded to there, so many things in shooting. I mean, it's it's fun for an enthusiast to go deep into the weeds and start talking about, you know, oh, let's talk about parallax and all these ballistics and the Coriolis effect and, you know, wind spin drift and all wind and all that stuff. BC, temperature. <sighs> the list goes on, I mean, right? But none of it really matters that much. If you can't even get the fundamentals of marksmanship right, what you're doing behind the gun, on the trigger, looking through the optic, and just you know breaking that shot. I mean, you have to do that right before any of the other stuff can even begin to be of any sort of importance to you. Right. So The fundamentals at its core um, translate across the board to all genres of shooting. It doesn't matter if it's pistol, carbine, bolt rifle, scope gun, not scoped. Um, you know, the the base fundamentals, and I say the base fundamentals because there's, there's technically there's four base fundamentals of marksmanship. You have steady position, aiming, uh, breathing control, and trigger squeeze. Uh, I say as it applies to precision rifle quite often when I talk about the fundamentals is because if you go through those each four steps and break them down and really explain them to somebody, I mean, there's many bullet points in each of those steps. Right. Uh, and it's pretty often that we end up snagging one of those bullet points and make it its own important fundamental. So when I talk about fundamentals of, let's say, precision rifle, I typically actually discuss five, and it's because they're five points that I feel like in order to be successful in precision rifle games, uh, especially in like uh, tactical precision rifle like NRL, PRS, that type, of, that type of shooting, you really need to have those pretty well hammered out. Okay. Got it. So there's you have five. I, I technically describe five or teach five. Okay. Uh, even though at the base is four, which that, that base kind of applies across the, the whole gambit. Got it. Now, before we jump into them, let me ask you, in terms of somebody practicing the fundamentals, trying to get them down, trying to get them into you know some sort of a way that it's more of a subconscious thing that they're doing rather mm-hmm. than conscious, uh, how do they go about... How do they go about starting that? Because you look at, everybody idolizes the tactical forms of shooting. Like, we're talking about precision here. You talk about PRS, NRL, that sort of thing, right? And you're doing all these shooting in crazy positions and off barricades and using bags and bipods and all that stuff. And you can apply all the fundamentals of marksmanship to any one of those crazy kooky positions and barricades, barriers, whatever. Um, but... You kind of have to get it down. I feel like this is this is my at least interpretation of it. You got to at least get it down like in the prone position first, or off a bench first. I mean, how do you generally, if you're just practicing it, not right. trying to apply it to some sort of crazy application, just practicing it? How do you usually do it? The first thing I like to do in any training session is fire some rounds from the prone position. Now, I think we all practice prone a little bit too much. 
it's by far the easiest. We do the best at it, so we do what makes us feel good, even though we should probably be doing a little bit more roof work off the rooftop or something like that. Uh, but starting off in the prone position, the reason why I do that, and even though I, I know you said that not doing that crazy stuff, but if, if I actually pertain it to precision rifle, I like to, for one, map my cold bore shoot zero. So mm -hmm. validate where my first shot's going on a cold, clean, or not necessarily clean, but a cold bore. If I clean it, I want to know, notate that this is a clean cold bore and also map that. So that that's predictable every time for me. Um, but in that, when I'm firing a shot and then I'm doing a follow-up group to test my dispersion, there is zero reason why I would not take the time and apply every fundamental through every one of those shots to knock the rust off the fundamentals and be like, okay, well, this is how I'm starting off my training session, everything going the right way. So as I transition to shooting off of a barricade or as I stretch out to longer range, I already have those fundamentals replanted back in my brain so that I do that when I'm actually practicing rather than just blowing some rounds down range and wasting ammo and not really getting enough out of my practice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jim was talking about, you know, practicing enough to get into the, you know, kind of make it more of a subconscious act, right? But you're kind of talking about, you know, definitely actively kind of going off your checklist there. Are you are you just doing that just to reinforce it? And then when it is go time, you're kind of letting your training take over? Right. Or when you're breaking a shot, like during a high pressure PRS match, are you like, kind of going through that checklist at the same still no i i think uh it's subconscious when you're actually you know when the when the clock is running and time matters and you're and you're just trying to get hits um but it's that repeat over and over and actually going through that checklist and you had even if you're shooting by yourself or i mean you might look like a crazy person if you do it at the range and there's a bunch of people around but laying down prone and you say okay good position check you know uh, breathing, checking it, going through the, all those fundamentals out loud to yourself just so mm -hmm. you know you're doing it uh, rather than just skipping through and pulling the trigger. Yeah. It's one thing I know, too, uh, speaking from, and I'm sure it's not just optics manufacturers, rifle manufacturers, barrel manufacturers. I mean, it's something that I think we all wish everyone would go through, too, when they start to see maybe some inconsistencies in their shooting. It's always worth at least going back and doing that because, you know, if you all of a sudden, you're not sure why you're missing it, some target that normally you've hit in the past. I think a lot of people are instant to be like, well, it's the gear. It's, it's my scope. It's my rings. It's my barrel. It's my whatever. Something shot out. My, I'm not, this reload isn't right. The powder's screwed up. Mm -hmm. um, Jim, are you insinuating <laughs> that it may not be the equipment? Well, I don't... Heaven forbid. I, let's not go here. that. <laughs> let's not get extreme. <laughs> um, no, it's always the equipment's fault. No, but, but, I'm just kidding. Uh... But it's something good that you can go through at least to just chill yourself out. Sure, you're going to have to go back to maybe the more boring stuff. But um, but it's so important to at least knock off a number of variables because ultimately you, the shooter, are a huge variable in a, in a game that has, I mean, infinitely many variables already as is. Right. Yeah, so if I take... Each of those fundamentals, break them down and repeat them over and over at the beginning of every practice. Then again, they do become second nature. And when we talked, I can't remember what, if it was during the pod venture or if it was something else, but we were talking about um, accuracy and precision and, you know, making correction. Oh, it was the wind correction one that we were talking about this. If I take a shot and I hit, let's say, left of center on the target, if I know that I'm doing all my fundamentals correctly, I'm following my process and I'm pulling the trigger right and everything from top to bottom, I'm doing my job and I know the rifle's capable, the capability of the weapon system. If I see that impact there, I know that I can correct off that shot. Mm -hmm. If I hit there and I don't know if it hit there out of luck, Ooh, if yeah. it was, you know, I did everything right, if I pulled my shot and it happened to go to the right spot. So I'm less confident in my correction. Yeah, so, I mean you can trust mm -hmm. you can trust that impact. Yeah. So to, and also actually being able to see that impact is due to the fundamentals. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. God, yeah. It's all interconnected, Jim. If your fundamentals aren't very good, you're not gonna be able to actually observe your, your hits and misses, um, at least not very well. Interconnected like a series of 
tubes. <laughs> like the internet. Yeah. It's like a circle. I, like a circle, <laughs> not a triangle. I'm, I'm thinking in my head of uh, watching The Office when Michael Scott's like just heaving this baseball toss half court <laughs> shot in the basketball game episode and he just like, he misses and he's like, what is wrong with me today? It's very much, it's like I, I oftentimes see people shooting and they're shooting at like 800 yards off some weird position like something's messed up with it and it's like oh or maybe it's just a hard shot and you're not really doing it that well right there's right. always a possibility but um all right have we uh, i think we've set the stage we've set the yeah. stage quite a bit here. i'm ready to go through yes. the fundamentals and kind of break those down a little bit right let's, so let's do it yeah i can uh let's start by actually just talking about the fundamentals as it applies to everything right okay so the first being steady position so obviously we don't want the firearm to be all over the place when we're pulling the trigger. So building a steady position now with a precision rifle, um, that can mean a lot of things. Uh, for one, first of all, I like to be squared up behind my rifle as much as possible. Now I obviously understand that there are some positions you get into where fully squaring up where your shoulders are perpendicular to the target as well as your hips are perpendicular to the target, your toes are perpendicular, everything is perfectly squared up. Uh, not always possible. However, if, if my entire body has to be slightly twisted, but my shoulders are still squared up, that's better than nothing. So, um, body position is really important. Uh, I need to be comfortable behind the rifle too. And, um, that will all aid in, um, making the rifle itself steadier. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, after that, we, uh, go into aiming and, um, this covers a lot of different stuff. Uh, but we've all talked about natural point of aim. So uh, essentially yes. when the rifle is at rest and you are laying behind the rifle or standing behind the rifle, uh, if you were to close your eyes, take a couple of deep breaths and open your eyes again, you're still on target. It's the same concept here. At, uh, the body at rest is still on target. So developing that natural point of aim. Like how, and so for a person who like may not be look, looking through a rifle scope right now, like how... Like how on target? Like perfectly on target or mostly on target? Like like what would be Does acceptable to distance? you? I, th I think it's going to depend on the shooting discipline and um, you know what mm -hmm. exactly we're doing. Now, I can't speak from a pistol standpoint because I'm a, just a horrible pistol shooter. If it's if the gun doesn't weigh 20 pounds and, <laughs> and shoots <laughs> tiny little bullets really Nick, fast. I think we and have a place where you can work on that. <laughs> right. It's across yeah. the parking lot. It's called Vortex Edge. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I actually just, uh, just finished up my slide for doing the Team Sniper Challenge stuff next year for my pistol. So I'm going to, oh, cool. I'm going to start doing a lot of pistol work because that's where I need the most improvement. So, um, yeah, so after we talk about aiming, and this actually, so natural point of aim, a good sight picture is really important here in the aiming process. So when we're, especially behind a rifle scope, you know, and again, I'm, most of my, my process is built through long-range shooting and precision rifles, so I, I kind of tend to talk about that the most. But sight picture, I want to make sure, for one, that my face is properly aligned behind the rifle, um, and that is for both... Um, uh, field of view, um, my left to right and forward and back. So for one, if I'm looking through my rifle scope and I have that vent, the netting, that black fuzz coming in around the outside, that means either my face is too close or too further away. Uh, that comes into rifles setup as well. You can kind of work that out by fixing that early on in the process. Yeah. I mean, I know people that have, they just deal with like, well, the guy at the store mounted my scope and this is just what it looks like and right. I deal with it and really they should make that adjustment on the right. front end of that process. Well, as you know, a guy at the store had a giraffe neck and he was six foot seven and right. you know, you're like five foot six. Through no fault well, of his own. And really commonly it's there's <laughs> <laughs> some people just have giraffe necks. Some people just have giraffe necks. Uh, a lot of people actually will will uh, set up their rifle scope on their rifle and they'll have it on the lowest magnification. So mm -hmm. their um, their eye box and their um, uh, why am I brain farting this? I'm sorry. Eye relief. Um, eye relief is the most forgiving at, at the lowest magnification. Right. So they set it up there and then they turn up to the highest power and that eye box shrinks down and all of a sudden like, oh shoot, I'm outside of that perfect spot. Uh, so that can be an issue. And again, that's just initial setup can really help prevent that, mm -hmm. but not just forward and back, but we're talking also left and right. So if I see that black vignetting coming in on just one side, I know my head is out of position that way. Um, well, fun fact, you can actually check for parallax doing that as well. If you induce some vignetting, 
then you can see, okay, if that venetting evenly displaced around my image, then I am going to be parallax free or within the center of my, my vision That's throughout what the optic. Mike Tussle was talking about in the podcast we recently recorded on parallax. Yes. Oh, yes. That up. Depending on when this releases, if you haven't heard it yet, wait and tune in and find out. Yeah, that's a really good trick, especially if you're uh, shooting a target closer than your parallax will go down to. Okay. You know, so okay. if you're shooting something that's 35 yard parallax, like I got on my four and a half to 22, if I'm shooting a 10 yard target, I can't adjust down all, all that parallax out. So although I can usually get my image in good enough focus, still knock me parallax free. So I just back off the gun a little bit, like introduce some of that venetting and center myself up and take the shot. After sight picture. Mm -hmm. Then we talk about breathing. So um, in the breathing process, everybody has a deep in, out, in, out. However, on your out, you'll find that you can pause for a long time. So you go, (sighs) 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 so that long pause there is called your respiratory pause. And that is when you're most at rest. So if you are behind your rifle, you take a deep breath in, you exhale, and then you can sit there. And that is where on that exhale is where you actually should be starting your trigger squeeze. Um, and your trigger should break on that pause. So you don't actually mm-hmm. want the gun to surprise you when it goes off. That's kind of a... That's kind of a, yeah, definitely a misnomer, misconception thing. Yeah. If it, if it totally surprises you... <laughs> The next steps are going to be a little bit more difficult. Yeah. So, kinda, like, you know what they're getting at when they say it. Yeah. yeah. Because they're trying to avoid like slapping the trigger, right? Exactly. Or, like, just ban- you know, jerking that thing. But yeah, trying to at avoid the same bad time hats. too. If you're like, oh my gosh, my gun went off. <laughs> right. yeah, that's not. Good. It's promoting. Yeah. I think the idea is to promote a good trigger press. Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, and and not, break- a, not a negligent negligent. negligent. <laughs> yeah, we want to avoid those. Oh, surprise, possible. everybody! Yeah, yeah surprise. Um, hope your foot's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in that, you know, we want to do really watch our breathing. Um, and people actually, you've ever heard on, you know, people talk about shooting in between heartbeats. Yeah. Uh, if oh, you yeah. actually do get your heart rate down, if you if you're somebody who has a good steady heart rate and you're breaking your shots in that respiratory pause, you can see that. Tick, oh yeah. Tick. So if you know when that you're going to have a tick, you should be just about breaking it as. The last tick happens. It also helps if you don't have an eight pound trigger that you have to load up for like 30 seconds. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. Very unpredictable. <laughs> that is very true. Um, so after breathing, we talk about trigger squeeze. Um, this is really important. You want as much consistency as possible. Uh, so identify your trigger and get used to it. So I use a lot of fat or fat flat <laughs> face triggers on my guns. Uh, I like the Trigger Tech Diamond triggers, and one of the nice things about that particular trigger, it's got a little hook on the bottom, just a little, it just pops out a little bit. But when I place my finger on that trigger, I have kind of an indexing point. I can feel that that little hook right on the bottom of my finger, and I know that I have the trigger, my finger placed in the same place every time. Uh, Not only that, but I have my finger at a a, a 90-degree angle, so it's um, perpendicular to the length of the rifle and okay. um, it's a completely straight back movement I'm not manipulating the rifle with my trigger hand at all besides the trigger so a lot of people uh, mark um, wrap their thumb around the <laughs> hey if you're if you're trying to control old Betsy over here you'd wrap your thumb too right oh Betsy that's right yeah that's, the, that's, the oh, 12 neither. pound 6.5 creed well, yeah. I'm talking about the one to the right eight. of it Jim Oh, oh okay. yeah, got it. The, old the thunder uh, cannon. Yeah, the three hundred lightning. <laughs> <laughs> the three hundred lightning. Yeah. So, and that's that's an important thing, and it's not something that everybody feels comfortable with doing. And I always say, if you can put your thumb around the stock and and without manipulating the gun throughout the recoil process, then that's fine. Just as long as when you're pulling the trigger, the only muscle that should be flexing is right here. You know, right, right, in, right in trigger finger. Yeah. Now, let me ask this. So, like, <clears throat> from, like, maybe, like, you know, a hunting scenario or something like that, like, shooting, like, maybe you're taking an offhand shot. You still want to practice those fundamentals of marksmanship as best you can. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and actually, you probably need to have them down really good to shoot well offhand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but keeping your thumb on the other side seems like that seems weird to me at that point. But would you still shoot with your thumb? Yeah. Resting yep. to the right, even yeah, I really hand. would. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm doing all of my, you know, if I'm if I'm actually trying to pull the rifle back into my shoulder, I'm doing that with my support hand, anyways. 
You know, I'm not okay. pulling it back with, with my trigger hand. I'm pulling it back with my support hand. The trigger hand is almost floating on the gun a lot of times. Yeah. Okay. I know that, like, with the carbine, like an AR-15, a lot of those guys, you know, like Justin or whoever down at, at Vortex Edge, they'll always say, you know, those are meant to be fired, what do they say, used aggressively, fired yeah. aggressively. Right. So they'll have their thumb wrapped around that, but that's yeah. sort of a different, it's know, a different, different, different story and application altogether. Absolutely. And not aggressively, like, in a mean way, like, in a <laughs> take charge, kind of, just... Oh, you can driving the gun. You're yeah, you're you driving drive, the gun. You can drive your gun in a mean way if you want. You don't have to be <laughs> well, a mean person. I think there's yeah, you don't have to be mean about that. it. But you Mark, mean. ever averse to uh, meanness and aggression? Yeah, meanness, conflict, aggression, confrontation. Hate them all. <laughs> no likey. <laughs> I was trying to teach my girlfriend how to shoot the shotgun without it knocking her over, and uh, I I told told her that the stance that she needs to take when she's shooting is called the aggressive Sarah stance. So uh, okay. it kind of you know, works, yeah. Mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, after trigger squeeze, um, then we, we need to follow through. And this is the one I think, if I had to say that there was one fundamental that is the most important in my book, it would be that um, proper follow through because it's the one that most people screw up and the one that induces the most bad habits. So when you pull the trigger, you want to keep that trigger depressed to the rear until you know where the round went. So if I missed, I will have pulled that trigger to the rear long enough. And that's because I've identified where the bullet went. If I hit, I should be able to say, okay, where did it hit on the target? And then adjust and then, you know, put a new round in the chamber. Um, I, I usually, if, I, if I'm doing like a class where I'm, I'm teaching people to properly follow through, I usually even force them to say, all right, as soon as a shot breaks, count out loud one 1,000 and do not pull your finger off the trigger until you've actually said that out loud. And you'll notice a lot of people actually have a really hard time doing that because they're so used to immediately pulling their finger off the trigger like they're shooting a machine gun or popping their head up off the stock like they're looking for where the round went when they have a magnified optic sitting right in front of them that would more easily show them where that round went. Mm -hmm. So that's those are hard habits to break, but uh, I would also say that if you are in those habits, you are going to miss more targets than you would if you didn't have them. Yeah. So that proper follow-through is a really good one to practice. I, I watch a lot of really high level pro shooters actually um, have issues with that too. And I think a lot of it, truthfully, in, in my personal opinion, I'm probably gonna get some flack for it, but I think triggers are set too light in a lot of cases. So I told Mark before this that I was gonna talk to him about what happened at the Vengeance here. And that was his rifle is fairly light. I mean, for that application. Yeah. And it still has some recoil. It's not going to kick the crap out of you. It's a 6.5 Creedmoor, but it's still fairly light for that application. That trigger was Comparatively set. to the other right. rifles yeah, I that mean, were out there, for sure. My rifle weighs about 22 pounds, and yours is, what, 13? 13, 16. It can't be much more than that, yeah. 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 So, and I, I was shooting a 6.5 Creedmoor as well, but, you know, almost double the weight, my gun recoil is about half as much. So... Uh, your trigger was set way too light for you. And I was watching you shoot, and I know that you were having a hard time following through with your shots, and I asked if I could shoot your rifle, and I couldn't follow through because the gun was recoiling so much that with the light amount of pressure that I was actually placing on the trigger, it was essentially pulling the gun back away from my finger. So I couldn't properly follow through with my shots. So then we adjusted your trigger up, gave it a little bit more pounds, and it worked great that way. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really neat thing to call out too because i think so much when people are talking about like quotation mark what's a good trigger or, oh it's like oh i got it this light mm -hmm. i got it this light i got it this light where in this case it was the opposite we needed to add a little bit mm -hmm. to you know i guess increase you know our ability to practice the fundamentals of marksmanship you know in this, in yeah. this part of it the, the follow-through a lot yeah. of these things become a bit of a game for people like how low can i get this number how high can i get that number and and, and then it takes out the practical application of what that number even means and so yeah it's it's sometimes adding weight to a trigger can improve things right yeah and, and you know a lot of guys run like a, a four ounce trigger which is too light for me and maybe that's a lack of experience on my end um, they may have it an even heavier gun than you're shooting though but that's true yeah i mean if you're shooting a 25 pound rifle having a four ounce trigger you probably can follow through with those shots right. if it was in a 12 pound gun no way in hell you could follow through unless that gun was you know locked into something like literally clamped in 
uh, the gun's going to move too much for your finger to actually continue to pressing that to the rear. Mm-hmm. So your follow through is not going to be good, and yeah. you're going to get yourself into bad habits. Now, when somebody's shooting something like Mark's 300 Winchestershire Shortest Maximus here, <laughs> um, what, like, that was, I mean, this 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 thing's got to be hard to follow through on. You know, I mean, it, you can't, when you're shooting a PRS gun, thing's heavy, it's on a bag, you've got your hand over the scope, and really braced in. When you shoot, you know, there may be a little recoil to deal with, but you can generally keep it really controlled and then look through the optics, see where the round goes, all that good stuff, right? I mean, but when you're using this thing, I mean, it's, it's an event when the gun goes off. Oh, yeah. Like, how are you even going to follow through on that? You follow through the same way. Um, you know, I mean, you keep your face down, keep your trigger finger pulled to the rear, even though you probably are going to come off target. Um, you should have enough experience with that weapon system to know that, okay, I did everything right. The bullet went to the right place. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, then you won't need to know where the animal went because you're going to walk over, find the blood trail, and find it within 10 seconds. Yep. So... Um, a caveat to that is that if you don't know your weapon good enough to know whether or not you can actually make that hit, you should, for one, probably not be pulling the trigger on it. Two, definitely have somebody spotting for you to watch where that animal's yep. going. Yep. And, you know, I'm so familiar with this guy. I mean, it, it's we talk about it all the time. I'm sure people are sick and tired. I mean, it is snappy. It is not pleasant to shoot. I love it. I've hunted it tons and tons and tons and tons. Uh and I shoot it actually pretty darn well. I didn't shoot well at the Vengeance, but curiously enough, Ryan Muckenhern, who I consider like one of okay, this is, yeah, this is not even gonna be a humble brag. This is gonna be a brag. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to get around this at this point, Jim. Just do it. Anyway, you're in. You're in I would. I was shocked. So we took this gun down to the range, and I said, "Hey, Ryan, I'm going on this uh, bear hunt. You know, I just want to confirm my zero. Have you shoot it? Have me shoot it?" And I just I'm so used to that gun that I actually shot it better than. Ryan, again, like I said, it's not. It's just like now I just sound like an a hole. But anyway, well, there is something. The, the, the point being, like I'm used to that gun, and I know how it shoots. I know how it feels. I, even though the trigger's like probably definitely breaks heavier than this one over here, I know when it breaks. I know what it feels like. I know what the yep. sight picture looks like. All those different things, and that just comes down to familiarity. Yeah. Right. But when it, so I shoot it really well. When it comes to follow through, I doubt that is happening though. Like in a lot of ways, like maybe to a degree because I'm getting a good trigger press and then boom, it goes off. But it's a pretty big explosion. I am off target. I'm generally shooting at an animal, which they either, like you said, it's either tipped over or it's standing there possibly still if it isn't running. But then it's like I'm reassessing a dynamic scenario. So then I pull my head off the gun pretty much immediately to right. see what happened. Well, a lot of people, um, if they start adopting bad habits, um, I, I see a lot with with hunters and I hunt too. So I, I'm not like dissing anybody who hunts in any way, shape or form, but typically we like to shoot lighter weight rifles, mm-hmm. um, with large cal- caliber projectiles moving pretty damn fast. Yes. And, uh, all the boxes. and, and they move you around a little <laughs> yes. bit. Yes. Yes. <laughs> talk to me. Yes. Um, however, for one, those tend to be a large culprit for inducing mm-hmm. these bad habits. Yep. And two, it's a lot harder to see when those bad habits pop up because that violent explosion, your body moving all over hell, mm-hmm. you can't see what you're doing wrong. That's one of the reasons why, like if I'm if I'm doing any type of training or just you know out shooting with somebody and they're kind of having an issue hitting a target, which should not be difficult. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll have them close their eyes and I'll I'll load in the case for them. And I'll do that, you know, four, five, six rounds, and then I'll take, you know, a spent cartridge or a dummy cartridge and stick it in there and have them close it and then shoot. And then all of a sudden you see their body like violently twitch when they pull the trigger, even though the gun didn't go off. The old ball and dummy. Yep. Yeah, it, it <laughs> it's really apparent too. <laughs> and then they trick. usually look up to you like, what the hell was that? Like they just had a little seizure or something. And they're like, well, uh, um, you didn't see that, did you? And like, yeah, I saw it, bud, and that's why you've been missing the target. Mm-hmm. Um, but usually that's like an snap oh shoot okay i'm doing something wrong it's not the gun it's not the ammo it's me how do you fix me now Mm -hmm. and that's you know that's usually again a very telling thing but it also usually encourages somebody to say okay i need to take a step back and start back at the beginning yeah a huge step of it is just at least realizing that you're doing it Mm -hmm. because when i mentioned ball and dummy that's one of the drills that they run down at edge a lot when people are shooting pistol and it's hard to determine you know again because of 
pistol. We're not talking about a violent 300 wisdom level explosion in front of you, but we're talking about an explosion nonetheless and a reciprocating slide mass in your hands extended out from your body that you're trying to aim with rather precisely. And oftentimes it's it's people trying to control the recoil at the wrong time. You know, you, you right. call it like it. Call it a flinch. Sometimes it's a flinch because some guns, like you know, when some people get behind Mark's big, big boy here, uh, you know, it can be a bit like unnerving. So you know, there's that. But also sometimes you are trying to do the right things. You're just doing them at the wrong time, or you're trying to hurry it up, make the process happen now instead of letting it happen. And yeah, um, yeah, it's it's a pretty frequent thing. Almost, right. I mean, Almost everybody that comes through and does a pistol class with us, that, that, that'll that happen at least once, where it's like, okay, here, I'm going to load this up for you. Loads in the dummy round. Now go. Right. Click, you know, and you yep. instantly jerk that thing. Yeah, and it's, um, I, I and I, again, I can't really speak from a pistol standpoint, but I have heard people say that when they do that, like, it's actually pretty natural for the hands to drop a little bit, mm-hmm. but it's when you get tw- twist left and right or, like, the mm-hmm. um, fast wrist action that's where that's where you start really seeing problems yeah yeah some people now getting into pistol like some people you'll see if they're shooting and they have uh malfunction or something like that in the middle you'll see them boom 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 they'll get to that spot and then you'll see their hands dip and that's that's different because their hand is really actually just preparing right it's doing the thing when it knew it was supposed to do the thing it's just that the gun didn't go off right i actually caught myself this weekend we were doing uh, an event down in texas and uh, i got to I, i've shot a couple of machine guns before but never shoulder fired machine guns usually like off of uh you know like an m2 oh and, that's all uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah just that basic m2 stuff yeah, yeah. and um but i got to shoot a. uh an MP5K, MP5SD, mm-hmm. and uh, MP7. And I notice on all of them being that, you know, you have to re- pull your finger from the trigger faster, you know, to make the gun stop going. Um, and I, there was one time where I closed the bolt on nothing and I pulled the trigger and I saw myself do that. And I was like, oh, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I caught myself and it's like immediately what I want to do was go dry fire. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I want to say, all right fix that now yeah but that's um being able to identify those things when they do happen is huge because you're never going to improve as a shooter unless you fix yourself absolutely well i tell you like going back through these things again and and looking at your number one for example and even diving further into that like building a building a solid position um that's one that i think so many people have a difficult time doing it may, well, I shouldn't say that they have a difficult time doing it. Like, it's hard to do. It's, it's really not always that hard to do. Sometimes if you're in a tricky, you know, positional shooting environment or something like that, you do kind of have to think about it a little bit. Right. But I think it's a thing that a lot of people just compromise on because yeah. they just sort of are like, that's eh, good enough. Like, I'm fine. You know, for example, a rear bag. Like, you see people all the time. The rear bag is there, and maybe if you just positioned it slightly differently or, like, squeezed it, it would come up enough to where you need it but a lot of times people just stick a hand in there and they're like right. yeah I just stick my hand in there that's good enough and then they have to like now they're holding the gun at the rear and there's more chance for movement it's not steady in there anymore you just you did that when in reality a little changing around of a bag or just moving a bipod a little bit more would have created a much more stable shooting platform the, the position part is, I mean, it is the first portion of it. So if you don't get that right, you're going to have a pretty difficult time throughout the rest of the fundamentals. But mm-hmm. if we talk about position, um, like a big one that I see a lot is we have somebody lay down prone, take some shots and just to see what they're doing. And you see a lot of people immediately can't their body dramatically to the side. Like, I don't know, trying to oh, imitate yeah. the old green army men thing. Um, don't do that. You know, it, it, you want to lay straight behind your rifle. Why do you want to do that? Lay straight behind the rifle? No, why, why, do you do you, wanna... why, why is there that tendency? And I know I've caught myself doing it as well. Um, I, I don't know if it's um, probably just a habit that just shows back up, you know? I th- my opinion on it, let me, I'm going to throw this out there. Okay. See if it sticks. My opinion on it, when you're prone shooting, you're on your stomach. Let's go to... Uh, another time that we're frequently laying on our stomach, which is like sleeping. Okay. When you sleep at night, you don't sleep like this on your stomach with your chin up. Right. Most people sleep with their head sideways, right? Like one okay. way to the left or to yeah. the right. And so you're thinking like, I'm laying on my stomach, so I'm going to have my head. Like people just naturally go to their head when to be to the side, in which case 
if you were straight on with a rifle, you wouldn't be looking through the scope. So people, I think, kind of kick themselves to the side so they can lay like they lay in bed at night yep. on their stomach and look through the gun. I mean, that's, that's my opinion. That's an interesting and that's hypothesis. Actually, I think you actually might be really on to something there because one of the things that I see a lot of times is people, if they lay straight behind their rifle, their their bipods are way too short for them because then they end up having to like crane their neck straight back, which yeah. honestly, that's a I'm a huge proponent of getting a little bit taller bipod than you think you might need. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, I mean, there's a lot of them that I, I really like, but like the sky pods. So I have them on, on most of my guns now and I absolutely love them. But one of the reasons that I like them so much is that they're so adjustable. Mm -hmm. um, even the standard sky pod, which is the single pull, which you have the double pull on yours, mm -hmm. which is awesome. But the standard one, uh, I can almost shoot from a sitting position. It gets so tall, but it also gets so low that my magazine is literally in the dirt. Hmm. So it's so very adjustable that I can make it fit everything. And I see a lot of people that have their bipods just set way too low because, I mean, the closer you are to the ground, technically the steadier that you could get theoretically um however if you're going to be laying in a position for a sustained amount of time having that bipod up a little bit taller with just a little bit thicker rear bag will actually do a couple of things for one it won't have your neck crane back so much so you won't get that soreness in your neck which you and then you also won't induce as much eye fatigue because you have to look up quite a yeah. bit when you're laying down that flat but it also brings your chest up off the ground a little bit and if you're moving around doing a lot of strenuous exercise or something like uh, running from in inside of a stage or maybe you're hiking up a mountain you have to take those shots uh, when you lay down and you have your chest up off the ground your heartbeat affects your reticle a lot less and same oh, with your breathing okay. too I'd yeah. imagine yeah yeah you're not your body weight's not pressing down on your chest so when as you breathe it's not as hard to expand your lungs mm -hmm. yeah I would think also like when you are seeing that um, that reticle tick essentially with your with your heartbeat, I would think that's also a sign that you've built a pretty stable position that you're seeing that. Yeah, if you're actually watching your reticle tap with your heartbeat mm -hmm. and you don't see all the other movement, just that tap tap tap, then yeah, you're in a pretty good position, you know. Yeah. And at that point, it would be worth your time to take a few deep breaths unless you're shooting a really big target and that tapping is well within the center of the target yeah. taking a couple of breaths to slow that tap 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 down so that you can actually break a nice clean consistent shot mm -hmm. yeah it's there's so many things about getting in the right position i mean being comfortable that that is something again that i feel like so many people compromise on they're like there's something about shooting guns you're like oh yeah i'm a badass because i'm shooting a gun i don't have to be comfortable but at, at the same time it's like I mean, I've tried shooting before in just uncomfortable positions, and it doesn't take long for you to be like, this sucks, let me just rip the trigger and get out of here. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? yeah, I mean, it just is what it is. I mean, if you can find a way to get yourself um, in a way that doesn't suck, your mm -hmm. shot will be that much better. Because you're not, your brain isn't simultaneously focusing on like, ow. Right. <laughs> that hurts. Well, to extend further into that, we, we talked about when we were shooting up barricades, just doing practice and doing a little train up, we did, um, talked about bent knees versus straight knees and bending at the waist versus, you know, squatting and how like muscle fatigue can set in so quickly when you're trying to build a position. So like try to use that bone on bone structure. Yeah. Um, if you, cause if you start inducing your muscles to try to steady yourself, that has a short shelf life. Yeah, yep. you're going to start shaking really fast. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, like you're in an extremely uncomfortable position and your brain is just screaming, pull the trigger so you can get out of the spot. Yeah. And that's a good way to miss a shot too. Same reason uh, when you try and do the old call of duty, inhale and hold your breath. Oh, why yeah. Why that doesn't last long either. Yeah. yeah. You're like, at first when you do it, you're like super steady. And then half a second yeah. in, you're like, everything's Which is weird wobbly. when you think about it because you think like, oh, I've got extra oxygen. Right. Like I should be like more stable or more comfortable or I have more time. But really, like you said, you let a little bit out and you can just settle in. The other thing that you can try to do is try to have more than one point of contact on a stable surface. So if you're shooting off of a prone position, right, you have your bipod out. And then rather than using your hand in the rear, creating mm -hmm. an unstable platform in the rear, you could make that third point of contact something like a bag that is taking out that human element. You I mean, you can still squeeze the bag to el adjust elevation and stuff, but um, it's not the same as like trying to use muscles in your hand to hold 
the back of the rifle still. So that third yeah. point of contact is always a good thing. Um, same thing, shooting off of some type of barricade structure. Um, like we use shot the PRS barricade. You know, you can get the rifle down on top of a barricade bag, and then if you actually like literally reach over and grab the the, the structure itself and press down on the the uh, the rifle to hold yourself more in place, you get now two points of contact. So a lot more stable doing mm-hmm. that. It applies to everything, really. It, the, well, I'd say one thing to keep in mind that I'm trying to think more of. It's like, okay, so in a hunting scenario, maybe you're in the back country, like weight is concerned, but like, w- what do I have with me that could be a rear bag? Is it my rolled up? sleeping pad is it a sweatshirt or is it you know your yeah. hoodie that you can ball up underneath you know and this is again probably in a more controlled scenario where maybe you have an animal it's on a hillside it's mm-hmm. feeding you know you're like you know you have the time to kind of do that but i guess i'm trying to be thinking about that sort of thing so how can i execute the best shot i can like improvising some of these tools that you guys use like on right. the prs side you know the the a couple of them that are really good is if you're, especially if you're backpack hunting, mm-hmm. you should always have your backpack with you, right? Oh, that dude. can be a front support. That could also be a rear support if you have a bipod and throw that in the back of the rifle on there. You just extend the bipod out and now you get a big rear bag. Uh, same thing if you're um, sitting down shooting. If you have a long bipod legs or shooting off a tripod, you can take your backpack, set it on your lap and use that as a rear bag sitting up straight. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's a really good question there. Yeah, I I love having a backpack. I some sometimes I carry a big backpack just because I know I want to shoot off it. Right. Like I don't even have that much stuff. Sometimes I carry usable. a big backpack to work every day. I, well, that's yeah, just every my, day. That, that's my computer bag. That's but uh, <laughs> but uh, like to me the best thing like I love like on a moderately warm day maybe you've been active but you still have your puffy jacket because you always you should always have your puffy jacket. Oh, we should have your puffy. But then you've got that just taking up all that space in your backpack, and then if you have to get prone, it's just like it's yeah. awesome. It yeah. Is. Another one that works really well is I have a, um, it's a sleeve that goes over top of my rifle. So mm-hmm. if it's raining or snowing, it, it'll go from the muzzle all the way oh. to the buttstock. Mm-hmm. And I, it's just, it's a elastic that has this essentially a, kind of like a rain fly for a, um, for your rifle. Yep. But that like Tim a solo hunter makes one of those. Good to know. Yep. Uh, I'll have to check that out. Um, the, the one I have like a puffy, it'll press down inside of its own little carrying pack uh, a lot of puffies will squeeze oh. down to its yep. own pocket to yes make exactly it. yeah so this is about four inches by four inch kind of a cube and um that i can use as a rear bag if i wanted to sure so yeah, i'm, I'm nice. never taking a shot with that thing on my gun so obviously it has to be off um the chances of it being rolled up and off is uh pretty high mm-hmm. so I, I have that as a reliable rear bag if i needed one in a pinch too yeah yep Going back into uh, another one of those things, dive a little deeper on another one of the fundamentals, um, aiming. Yes. Now, we did, uh, Nick, you and I did a couple 10-minute talks on this prior, but, um, you know, making sure your reticle is level mm-hmm. is obviously one of the things that's also really important when it comes to aiming. Um, what other little nuances are there? Maybe we can dive in on those a bit, too. Well, one thing, and I'm glad you actually brought the reticle being level, is that's another benefit of having that body position straight behind your rifle. Because mm-hmm. if you're cocked off to the side and you have your head tipped down, it's really hard to oh, see if that yeah. reticle's level by comparison to actually just being straight on with it. That's oh, good sure. Because your equilibrium's now goofed up by laying on your side. Everything's good. Yep, everything's good, I think. Crossing <laughs> your fingers now. Um, so in the aiming process, yeah, of course we want your good sight picture. Um, you want to make sure that you're parallax-free or parallax-free enough. I say parallax-free enough because, especially in action shooting sports like PRS, NRL, um, you're never going to make your rifle perfectly parallax free if you're shooting something like a troop line where you have, you know, rifle or targets of increasing distance. I like to set mine for basically a mid range target. So I'm parallax free enough at the close and good enough at the far, or maybe I'll lean towards whatever range has the smallest target so that parallax error matters more. <clears throat> so parallax free, uh, um, I want to make sure that for one, my diopter set up for me. That's a big one that I think a lot of people screw up is they have their fast focus eyepiece, you know, and they don't really think about it, what that thing's actually made for. It's, it's bringing that reticle into focus. It works like a, it works a lot like a corrective lens for a prescription glasses. Once you set it up, you're not grabbing another pair of glasses to take a different shot. You're leaving the damn thing alone unless your eyes significantly change or a different shooter gets behind the rifle. Um, I actually, even though I love the fast focus eyepieces, because I have, usually have a lot of people shooting my rifles, 
before a competition, I'll have it set up properly for myself, and I'll take a piece of electrical tape and wrap it around there and make sure it doesn't move during a match because it's fantastic to make sure, for one, if you have your diopter set properly, as you adjust your parallax, you know, parallax, its secondary function is uh, focus, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have your diopter set improper and you're trying to focus on your reticle, your eye is going to make the reticle focused. But in the process of bringing that reticle into focus, you're also going to defocus your image more. Yep. yep. No, I mean, that's where you can tell, and I've seen it, and then you'd make the adjustment. You're like, wait, the reticle's in focus. No, the target's in focus. The reticle's focused. Tar- and it's kind of like bouncing, mm-hmm. ba- it appears to be like bouncing back and forth almost. And we mentioned this in the, uh, in the Parallax podcast that we did as well with Ryan and Mike, but inevitably you'll strain your eyes hard enough. You'll be like, everything's in focus. Then you take the shot and... And the gun goes off. If you don't follow through very well, you come out of the scope. All of a sudden, your eyes, while this event is going on, have gotten to relax for a second. You go back into your scope, and you're like, everything's blurry. There must be a lens loose. And it's like, well, no. <laughs> your, uh, your eye just got to relax finally. And now, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's when a lot, of, like when you're setting up your diopter, you shouldn't just stare through it the whole time and keep on making the adjustments because your eye is going to focus it. Mm-hmm. So that's where you stop and you just look up at the sky for a little bit and let your eyes just relax and then you look through it again because yeah. you'll oftentimes you'll find, okay, I got it perfectly set up after two minutes of adjusting the thing. And then you look away and you just, like everything comes back into focus and you look back through it and you got a blurry reticle again. Yeah. Which a lot of times people think, you know, oh, there's something wrong with this thing. <laughs> Never yeah. heard that one before. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Going into the uh, level reticle thing, mm-hmm. um, do you recommend that a lot of people get a bubble level of some sort on their rifle scope? Is that is that pretty? Uh, yes. I mean, it can make a big difference. Yeah. Oh, surprisingly. Yeah. yeah, it definitely can. Um, I think a lot of times people confuse uh, a reticle being level to the rifle, um, in com- as opposed to reticle being level with gravity. Okay. Um, so if you, you can cant that reticle on that rifle severely um, in correlation to, let's say, the action. Like you could literally, what you're referring to is literally just have the turrets like at 45 degree angles looking all goofy. Right. And if I um, still have my reticle fairly level to gravity, um, my point of impact isn't going to vary all that much. It's basically going to vary the offset of my, my head over bore. Um, so not horrible. But if I um, don't have my reticle level causing the whole gun to be canted, as I dial up an elevation or as I hold over, then that bullet's not going to go straight up and straight back down. It's going to go up and then kind of dive off to the left or right, whichever way I'm canting it. And if you're doing it severely enough, especially like we said, shooting from a prone position with your body cocked off to the side, you can miss by quite a bit, especially yeah. if taking a super long range shot. It's weird because I had to clarify that the last time we talked about this because I was like, no, nah, Nick, you're not telling me that the bullet's actually like going to curve off to the right. And, and no. from what <laughs> from what you've gathered, well, did you gather that it almost, depending on how you cant it, it can have it, somewhat of like a... It's not it actually a, a curving effect, but what it is, is is it rather than it going... If you're looking at your target down range, and if you were to draw a line through your trajectory, yes. mm-hmm. for the most part, it'd be just a straight line. Okay. Like, you wouldn't be able to see... Barring any where, wind or whatever. Right. If you had a, if you had a, a line covering up your... The beginning of your trajectory, you would not be able to see your end of your trajectory because it'd be covered up by the beginning. Like, it'd just be a perfect straight up and down line. Um, tip your gun to the side... It would be a left and right line, but it would come down outside your your um, uh, your line of sight. So it would dip off to the side, left or right. And it, it is still straight up and straight down, but it's outside of your... It, it's going outside your line of sight. I think that's the best way to say it. Is it it's like a different of, launch it's angle like then? A, Mark, like, it's like a fourth dimension. It's like a it's fourth sa- dimension, It's Mark. sounding like it. it. It's really easy to look at when you're seeing a diagram. I'm trying to think of how to put it in the words properly, and it's kind of eluding me. But essentially what's happening is it's not going straight up and straight down uh, within your line of sight. It's going straight up and straight down at an angle, which is causing it to, for one, hit right or left, but mm-hmm. it's also causing it to hit a little bit low. Got it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Somebody's probably yelling at their radio right now, spin drift. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah, those are important things to consider too. Um, you know, and obviously this isn't a ballistics talk, but um, aerodynamic jump and spin drift, if you factor those out, I mean, you're going to miss by a couple of tenths on a lot of shots. So mm-hmm. that's important to consider. Do you think aiming 
the element of fundamentals of marksmanship. Well, I guess, so fundamentals of marksmanship, a lot of it doesn't really, like, we talk about all the fancy schmancy stuff. Doesn't matter if you don't know fundamentals of marksmanship. And it's like, yes, that's true. But then you can also take somebody who's really fundamentally sound. They've got a gun that's zeroed in at 100 yards and they're just hammering away at 100 yards. Then there is there, there is stuff you have to know outside of just the fundamentals in order to carry on and do more. I feel no like that's, so the, that's the foundation. They're hand though. in hand. But yeah. Um, I mean, here's the thing. Like, if you look at the size of a target, you're shooting in a, like a, a PRS match. I mean, the one that we shot here recently, that was a bad example because he made it very challenging. But typically, you're oh, looking I didn't at, notice. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I mean, we, we did so well. It's <laughs> hard to even tell. Typically, you're looking at a target that measures um, like a half a mil to a mil um, or approximately in the, in the in the ballpark of two minutes. Um, so if you were to like compound aerodynamic jump and spin drift, um, at the very least, you're still going to clip the edge of the target if everything else is perfect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, e- even if you didn't factor those in, you're still going to get hits. However, not as accurate, of course. And, um, it's a lot easier to improve your fundamentals than it is to understand a lot into ballistics. I mean, mm. you should be good at your fundamentals regardless. Yeah. So start the baseline, get those right. Absolutely. Yeah. So we were talking about um, canting your rifle scope and whether or not you should get a bubble level. My answer is yes. 100% you should put a bubble level on your rifle if you're going to be shooting any precision game, especially ones that have you shooting on a compromised positions. Is there kind of a distance where you're like, okay, inside this distance, maybe not so critical to have a bubble level outside this distance? Sure. Want to have that? It'll always compound as you go out to further and further distances, obviously. Um, and you'd have to cant your rifle a lot more inside those closer distances for it to matter as much, especially if you're thinking like a hunting scenario where you have a, a constant size target, right? Like you're not having your target size increase with distance. We're not measuring it in minutes of angle or mills. We're measuring it in, that's an eight inch target, the vitals on this animal. Mm-hmm. So as in that case, the, the target size is technically getting smaller angularly as you go out. So it matters more and more and more. Um, however, you know, if you're shooting like, let's say inside of 300 yards, you have to cant the hell out of your rifle to really throw you off that much. So yeah, inside of that type of range is not, not quite as important mm-hmm. Four, five, six, seven, eight. then mm-hmm. you need to start paying attention. And especially, like I said, shooting off of a compromised position, shooting off a tree limb for instance, pretty common for that type of thing to happen mm-hmm. shooting off a tree limb it's pretty easy to can your rifle yep especially if you're not standing on the on, uh, on if you're standing on uneven terrain like on a hillside facing down into a valley tree limb taking a shot one foot's much higher than the other maybe you've got one foot up on a rock i mean yeah canton by a couple of degrees is not outside the realm of possibility how about uh well we talked about some of the breathing stuff there earlier and, and going in a little further though on uh Trigger press, trigger squeeze, trigger pull, whatever you want to push, pull, squeeze, who knows what. It's, it's all the same <laughs> thing. Making the gun go off. Um, you mentioned dry fire earlier yeah. on. Mm-hmm. Um, we've we've gone back and forth, guys and I down at uh, at Vortex Edge. We've gone back and forth about how it's not like it's not a matter of well, should you just not do dry fire at all or do only dry fire? It's just weighting the importance of live fire versus dry fire and it's possible to maybe even dry fire too much to the point where you're not live firing enough and then you're not actually understanding or like really getting into your head the recoil control yeah, and recoil all that. mechanics yeah recoil important. mechanics yep uh you know but then also when you are shooting only live fire and you're not doing a lot of dry fire then i think like you mentioned earlier you can start to develop habits and stuff like that that you're just not noticing because they're only happening when an explosion is happening yep. mere feet in front of your face. So um, the combination there, how are you? How do you work that with your fundamentals? And when you do get to dry firing, what are you focusing on primarily? So when I'm focusing on dry firing, what I'm really focusing on is building those positions, uh, decreasing my wobble of that reticle on target as much as possible. Uh, I have... Um, uh, it's made by DST Precision. It's called their DFAT. and screws on the end of my scope. Uh, makes my rifle so I can actually focus down to like 11 feet. So I can mm. put 
targets up in my garage that are oh, really okay. tiny and just shoot off of barricades in my garage, you know, that's fantastic. Not literally shoot dry fire, obviously. The neighbors would be pretty pissed if I was shooting through my garage door probably, but... Um, it's your property, Nick. <laughs> right. I don't think the neighbor across the street would like it too much, though. <laughs> uh, so it, and that's one thing I really like to do is is just really focus on making my position strong and breaking the trigger properly every time, following through properly every time, just focusing on my process so that when I start putting rounds in the chamber that everything's actually doing what it's supposed to. Uh, when I get into doing dry fire or live fire practice, I don't know if everybody does this or if I'm just the only kook that does it, but I actually make dummy rounds of my own. And so like, I'll take my ammo out and I'll put it into a box and I won't actually look at the, the rounds as I load them. So I start loading dummies in with my regular ammo. So if I start shooting off a barricade and I pull the trigger and it lands on a dummy, the gun doesn't go off. If I was going to pull the trigger wrong or flinch or do anything like that, no, I'm going to notice it obvious. right away. Yeah. yeah. Self-induced ball yeah. and dummy. That is one of the, like, that's one of the things we've talked about too with dry fire is that, you know, every time the gun's not going to go off. So, I mean, you can look pretty dang good in dry fire at times. Like, oh, yeah. look at this trigger went off, nothing moved. And then, you know you knowingly put it around in and then all of a sudden your brain is like this is a whole different right. ball game but yeah when you give yourself that that little bit of trickery it does yep. force you it I, does i mean when i've done it i mean it 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 reveals things like you were talking about jim and and it, it reveals things you otherwise wouldn't have been able to see you know when the gun goes off when we were at the match i uh you know went to oh, yeah. put it around and around did not go in the chamber, and I actually I was feeling at least good about myself in this regard because I broke the shot, and then I followed through, and the gun was still on target, and I didn't flinch. Um, yep. it just I actually remember that, and you're like, "Well, I did that right," <laughs> 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 and that was great to see because you know that's that's one of the hard things is if like you, you start doing something like a bad habit during a match you're not going to see it unless you have somebody like recording and you can watch the video after. No, the intensity is like definitely right. ratcheted up mm-hmm. yeah. for sure. But if you load a round in your chamber that let's say that you forgot to prime or like for some reason you got a light strike and it didn't go off, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the only, t- only chances you really get to see it not happen. Or, or if you go to feed a round and it doesn't scoop one off the mag and, and, and now you have an empty chamber when you pull the trigger, then you get the seat as well. Yeah. So that was great to see that. Great practice. How many times, though, do you think that happens to people and they just don't actually ever even pay attention to what they did? You know what I mean? And I'm not saying if if, if it's happened to you and you haven't paid attention to it, like, like you're an idiot or anything like that, but I think you can take everything as a learning opportunity where some people, they're so focused on everything that's happening, you know, or whatever, that they, they pull the trigger and they get a light strike or they're gun didn't pick up a round or whatever and they flinch big time and their f- first thing they go to is like is like oh, I got to get that round out of there and put a new one in instead of like oh when I went to pull that trigger I flinched big time and you know I, all that stuff happened um that's that presence of mind and understanding and that's I think that is also part of what you're getting at when you talk about follow through yeah is some people as soon as the trigger's pulled the thing goes click and the gun goes off that shot might as well in their history books have just it's done, like right. it's, it's like a yeah. It, now at this point, anything that happened there is history. Who cares? But you can learn from every single one, and when you follow through, it gives you the opportunity to learn. How did I feel about that trigger press? Where were my sights when I pulled the trigger and it went off? Where are my sights resting afterwards? What's the trace looking like? What's the wind looking like? Where did I hit? You can learn a lot from your shot, and that's really what you get in that right. follow through. Yeah, every shot really is a learning opportunity. Yeah, if you hit the target and you just center punch the thing, fantastic. Send another one, right? Um, does that happen every time? No. Um, if you miss a little bit right, okay. Now I know I need to correct maybe a little bit more left. If I miss off the right of the target, like you know, I need to correct a lot more left. You know, yeah. and that's where you actually like, okay, I saw exactly where in the dirt that bullet hit. Measure from the center of the target to where that hit. Correct the exact amount, opposite amount, and send it. Yeah, and you 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 know get close to the center that time, and you know. So I think we actually talked about that before we shot it. Um, I I basically set a goal for you guys is like don't get DQ'd, like do every, be safe. That yeah, and that was great. Like I mean, it was a it was a very difficult match. The movement was just ton of movement, and um, neither of you guys did anything safety 
negligent. Like you guys were great the whole time, which was wonderful. And that was, I mean, honestly, I hate to say it. That was actually a really good goal because of the match itself was difficult Mm -hmm. and it would have been very easy to do something unsafe on accident. Yep. Um, so that was wonderful to see, but I think we talked about, um, I didn't basically said like, I don't care if you guys time out on every stage, which I timed out on a lot of stages. I don't care if you guys timed out on every stage, as long as you did everything, you did your process and took every shot for what it was, you know, took your time, pulled the trigger, followed through, saw where your shot went, corrected, you know, do all that. And that was, you, you guys both did it really well. I know, I know, I know you were a little frustrated with yourselves after the match in some, in some ways, but you shouldn't have been. Well, like you said, I mean, e- each one of those shots, or really every shot, like, that is a learning opportunity, right? Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you described it really well. If, you, if you're not treating it like that, it's a waste. You're like, that's a wasted it's shot. It's a wasted shot. Well, and especially during this time in history, when rounds are as expensive right. as they are per yeah. round, you might as well make every dang shot count. And right. it, it's going to help you avoid... A lot of frustration, too, because as we got into, and Nick, this is something you mentioned way early on in this podcast, but if you start messing things up and you're not actually consciously paying attention to what you're doing, but you're just messing things up, you're not going to figure out why. You're always going to wonder, is it the environment? Is it the me? Is it the gun? Is it the scope? Is it the rings? Is it the ammo? I mean, then you all of a sudden you start getting overwhelmed with all these things that are going wrong. And if you can't ever just get your stuff together... Right. and make you do you right, then you can never rule out one of the biggest variables, I think. And uh, I mean, it reminds me of high school sports. It reminds me of playing basketball. And sometimes, if you ever watch like a basketball game and you see a guy who's on a cold streak and he's not hitting shots, and inevitably like they miss one or two and they're usually a really good shooter or something like that. They miss one or two and then all of a sudden from there, it's like they miss a third one, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, and they're just bombing it. And it's usually because... You get frustrated, you're not paying attention anymore, and you're just chucking stuff up. Right. Like, it just becomes like, I'm just going to keep banging my head against the wall until something good happens. It's like, that's never a recipe for anything good to actually happen. Right. Yeah, you actually see it a lot when when you're sitting behind the line watching somebody else shoot, when you know that they're getting frustrated because they'll send a shot and it'll miss off right. You'll see it plug a hole in the dirt. And send another shot and goes exactly the same place. Send another shot goes exactly the same place. If they would just slow themselves down, take their time, stop, rebuild their position, get steadier, get more locked in, drive the rifle a little bit harder and see where that shot went, they'd say, I'm hitting to the right. I'll correct and get the next hit. But instead, they just start ra- keep racking the bolt, keep on sending it. What the hell's going on? Somehow... And- the more rounds I send. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to will it on the target with this next one. You know, oh, wind keeps on switching. Nope, man. You're just digging a hole in the same spot. You see it all the time, but it's really easy when you start, if you stop, start missing things that you feel like you should hit to just start pulling the trigger really fast and not thinking it through. Um, that's where that's where frustration starts happening. That's where bad habits start evolving because we, st- we get away from our process and we just start, again, start sending rounds and not, not learning from those. Uh, again, every shot is a learning opportunity, whether it's a positive or negative, it's still an opportunity for learning. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So did we cover them all? Did we get them all? Yeah, I, I, we didn't. Um, we didn't jump into trigger squeeze a lot. Uh, follow through again, I think, is an extremely important one, but. I think trigger squeeze. Um, I see. I see this happen a lot with more new shooters or people that maybe have coming from a different shooting discipline. Make sure you're using the pad of your finger. Don't use the crease of your finger. Don't use the tip of your Does finger. Does it matter which pad? Like the outside most or the one in the middle? Outside most. Got it. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that's a big thing. Is if why you, do you like that? Uh, it's a very consistent point. It's soft. It's spongy. Uh, if you go into your, n- your knuckle here mm-hmm. and you start squeezing from that, you get bone there that's closer to the surface. You start rubbing on that. It's slipping one way or the other. It's just a less consistent point. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. And also when you wrap that trigger inside of that point, you're actually bending your finger further than it should be. It should be flat against that trigger so that press is straight back, not curling around. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you, you really want to have that straight back pull in the trigger. That's why I like to – there's pictures of me shooting where I literally have my hand open like this because I'm so intent on not guiding the rifle with my trigger hand that I am only bending this finger and this hand's just floating out here. Yeah. One of the problems I have 
is that with my gun, it's like I have to jam a crowbar into the trigger guard in order to <laughs> make the gun go off. And so the crowbar is pretty hard. Uh, it's not that precise. Yeah, it's it, it makes it pretty difficult, you know. And you guys, you guys had totally opposite points. I think you actually said it several times, a mama bear trigger. We need to get you guys a mama bear trigger. Right. And actually, the trigger that Mark has in his gun, we just need to get you one of those and turn it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, to basically where you have, I think we said it about a pound and that was honestly for that rifle. Fantastic. Um, I think a lot of people hear, Oh, you have a pound for PRS rifle. It's crazy. No, it doesn't take that much pressure to pull a trigger on that rifle. It helped me. You immediately went from missing a lot to hitting a lot more. Like as soon as we turned up the trigger and I mean, it was, there's a good reason behind it though. I mean, it's not, it's not crazy. If you follow through with your shots, you'll hit more targets period. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can't follow through with your shots because of the amount the rifle recoils or having too light of a trigger, then, well, we need to figure out how we can make your gun worthy of following through. So real quick, Nick, just mm-hmm. to recap, the fundamentals of marksmanship are... Mark, and you it, should... Let's see if you've yeah, learned. Yeah, let's see if you learn, Mark. Let's see it. I'll, I'll build I'll a stable you. position. Yes. Uh, good trigger press. I knew breathe. you'd go straight to trigger press. Look at that. Just yep. p- position and then press the trigger. Yeah. Well, come on. Come on. Breathing. That's one of them. That's before trigger press. Yeah. There's, There's another one, one before, before trigger press, too. There's another one before breathing. Help me out here, Jim. Mark, we work for an optics company. Oh, get behind. Get a good sight picture. Yeah, that, that okay. falls under There's the There's a reticle in there. Level your reticle. Amy. 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 Yeah, that's Amy. what I was saying. For God's sake. I guess... I. I, okay, you you were on the right track, Mark. You you didn't. I was already aiming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was second nature, Jim. He just that he does that. That's right. That's right. Um, so it, you start off with right. a good stable position, or we can just narrow that down to position, aim, breathe, trigger, and then I like to to take that one bullet point off a of trigger and add on the follow through. Okay. So you got my, my <laughs> the five fundamentals according to Nick. Not according to some, probably, but um, the first four are the primary fundamentals. Position, aim, breathe, trigger. I like it. Follow through should totally be in there. Can't tell you how many shots I've missed because I didn't follow through. Yep, it happens a lot. Good stuff. Well, thanks, Nick. Well, let's, yeah. uh, let's for those of you listening, if you're watching on YouTube, as usual, comment below how the fundamentals of marksmanship have worked out for you. Uh, if you're still one of those people who says, ah, fooey, it's a bunch of baloney, um, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you're you. Wrong. You're, you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> you're probably missing a lot. Um, but, uh, yeah, let's hear it. Also, hit us up in the comments section for this episode at Vortex Nation Podcast on Instagram. Uh, yeah, but otherwise. I'll say this. You Mark know, has one final thought. You know when you get them all right. Generally yeah. because yep. you hit the target. You know. Yes, but it felt right. Shot is just you're like yeah like you almost like no you're like yeah this is gonna hit like i've got all the pieces of the puzzle together it's, on that it's one. like right. all your chakras aligned and like that yes. was correct i've been <laughs> i think spent a lot of money getting my chakras clean i think it's because <laughs> i've been playing a lot of basketball lately i had the michael scott example <laughs> earlier and then i talked something about shooting basketballs but like you watch one of those guys shoot and they know they got it right. Like you watch steph curry shoots a three-pointer just turns around starts walking back he knows he knows mm-hmm. You know. It's you know. true. When you know, you know. When yeah. you know, you know. All right. See you guys on the next one. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.